Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, everybody. William Harris here. I'm the founder and CEO of Element, and I'm the host of this podcast where I feature experts in the e-commerce industry sharing strategies on how to scale your business and achieve your goals. I'm excited about the guest that I have here today. I have Yarden Shockhead here. He is the founder of Veros, which is a VC-backed SaaS startup that gives performance marketing benchmarks to over 4,000 brands, agencies, and SaaS companies. Before starting Veros, he was a private equity investor, and he is also an active angel investor. Yarden, thanks for coming out here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm pumped about this. Yeah. And before we dig into the questions here, I do want to at least make sure that I announce our sponsor. Uh, This episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired with the largest one selling for nearly 800 million. And we were ranked as the 12th fastest growing agency in the world by Adweek. Uh, That said, let's move on to the fun stuff here. Yarden, when I think about uh, benchmarking uh, in Veros, uh, that's a very interesting niche. And there's got to be something that makes you say, you know, that why you're passionate about benchmarking. What was it that made you say, I want to start Veros. This is something that needs to exist in the world. Yeah, people a lot of times, uh, people a lot of times ask me, like, why are you devoting your life uh, to, to benchmarking? It's a pretty random, uh, very specific sort of problem. Um, I'll, I'll quickly take you through like how we, we sort of got there is uh, I used to work in uh, private equity and private equity, um, a lot of times to make an acquisition or to do due diligence on an acquisition, you'd want to understand how much room uh, for improvement does the company have so you can sure. expand their margins. And so uh, we would look at companies and let's say a company had 10% profit margin. You were trying to figure out, can they get to, let's say, 13%, 15%. Now, the way that you actually do it uh, is you say, well, okay, there's you know three equivalent companies that are at 13% margin or 15% margin. We can get there. Um, hmm. And it's not really like it, you know, what you would think of you go into a factory and you're like, oh, that's inefficient or something. That actually doesn't sure. really happen in real life, um, at least in, in my experience. And so- a lot of times we would make decisions based off that. But the issue was, is that a lot of times there aren't public companies, so you couldn't uh, have that type of data. Mm-hmm. So we'd spend boatloads of money on like McKinsey studies and BCG studies to get this type of information. And then, you know, if you think about it a little bit deeper, like it's actually kind of silly how the whole industry works that everyone has their data, but there's this like massive gap that's missing of, of the market data, like how you're comparing yep. uh, to others, just because it's not that it's not valuable, it's just inherently private. And so like it, it, we could think about it as sort of performance marketing benchmarks, which is like pretty specific. But if you think about like the broader uh, view of, of democratizing, you know, private data and like making people understand how they compare to others, I, I think that that's a really big piece of the data puzzle, but well, you yeah. know, slowly, slowly. Well, absolutely. And I think you and I have talked before. I'm I up until Veros, I'll be completely honest uh, with everybody listening here. I hated most benchmarks, uh, even some of the benchmarks that would get into um, a little bit more granularity where they'd say, well, here's the average CPA for someone in the fashion industry. It's still so broad that it didn't yeah. really mean anything. And then you'd have, you know, clients or companies that would come to you and say, well, you know, this report says that the average CPC for someone in fashion should be this. It's like, well, you know, you've got an AOV of $2,500. And so you're not getting in the (laughs) same boat as everybody else. And so there's there's a difference there. And so I think that's the thing about like accurate benchmarks. And that's what Veros helps to solve, right? Right. Yeah. And that's, it's exactly why I think that there, there needs to be like a standalone company that does it. You know, you'll see if you Google benchmarks and stuff, yeah. Facebook ad benchmarks, you'll get a million PDF sort of reports or some like throwaway feature from some company. But you really like what we spend our days doing is solving for nuances. Like yeah, of exactly that's so what you're hot. saying. Like, yeah. like adding, you know, that AOD filter, adding like countries filters or, you know, you you say like, well, it needs to be on the same objectives. Like brand awareness campaigns are completely different than conversion campaigns. Completely. And, 
prospecting, uh, going after, you know, new clients is completely different metrics than going after, uh, existing clients and like, you know, right. big companies versus small companies. And actually, you know, women's skincare is completely different than men's skincare. Like they buy differently and you can't right. just put skincare together. That's completely insane. And so there's like, you know, lots of these things that you're actually, our job is less like, is less sexy. It's really just getting all the, all the red flags out of there. So it's like as, uh, comparable as you can get it to be. Yeah. And you know, the way that I always describe a lot of this is, you know, the lurking variables, there's a really good article that I put out, um, maybe, man, I think it's a year old, but it might be two years old now about Simpsons paradox within advertising. Um, and you know, for those who aren't familiar with Simpsons paradox, it's the idea where you could have something that rolls up to saying, uh, let's say, something is better if you look at, let's say, ad A or ad B. And if you look at all of the aggregated data for ad A, maybe ad A ends up looking better. Um, but if you look at the lurking variables and you say, but wait a minute, what if, we, what if we look at this for new customers versus returning customers? What's interesting is within this, you know, when you segment that data set that way, you could find that ad B outperforms in both of those categories, even though the aggregate level ends up being better for ad A, ad B is better in both of those levels. It's just the amount that was weighted towards one or the other. And I think that's where better de benchmarking comes into play. Um, and what you guys do is you basically help to eliminate a lot of those lurking variables by, I can come into Veros and I say, you know, I want to see... Um, children's brands uh, with an average order value between 50 and hundred dollars, spending at least a hundred thousand dollars a month on prospecting. And, and now I'm going to get a benchmark that's way more relevant than anything else that I'm going to find out there. Completely that, that uh, totally. And so, and that's one side of it. And then the other side of it is just the, the, the timeliness of it. Like the, 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 the benchmarks that are out there are very stale. Sure. I mean, this market is so dynamic, like to a point that it just surprises me all the time about it just one month is different than another. I mean, we see this year that things are just a lot cheaper than they were last year. Sure. Um, well, and, and this happened with the, the meta bug just uh, the other what, you know, that's like a month old now. But didn't were exactly. you guys able to do uh, yeah, something with this? I think it's like two weeks. So it's it's still pretty new. And, and yeah. you know, for, for people that, that don't know, right, there's this massive uh, bug that I think it was a Sunday um, yes. that it, it just spiked. It, it, it basically spent everyone's budget in the middle of the night. Cause this, uh, I, I, uh, we, we gave, uh, we, we gave data for CNBC to this, to what happened. And the analogy I gave the guy was that, I don't know if it's a good analogy or not, but he put it in the article, which I was not expecting, which is that it, it's like in the middle of the night, it, it, you know, usually people are, are advertising their new shiny things, but in the middle of the night, everyone is just bidding on some meaningless product, like an old toaster or something. And there was a bidding war over it like there sure like it was just a bidding war over nothing because of some bug and so you know cpa is obviously completely uh skyrocketed and the thing is is that with veros because it's in real time you can know if these spikes are something that's a problem in your ad account or in the market mm. because if it's your ad account then that means that like you immediately need to change something something broke yeah. But if, in the, if it's in the market, you shouldn't be changing things in your ad account. Maybe you should be reducing spend because the sure. market's more expensive. Um, but it, it's like the, the analogy is, is if your power went out, is it, uh, is it you? Like, it, is the power yeah. out in your apartment that you need to call the electricity company? Or is the power out in your whole building and then it's kind of like, it's a different, it's a different ball game. You need to rewire the house or something. Well, yeah, I mean, and I see this happen very often where people will make changes unnecessarily within their ads accounts based on things that had nothing to do with their ad account. The ad account was completely fine. It was set up the way that it needed to be. But there was some other bigger macro thing going on over here. And, and to your point right. where it's like, you're actually undoing good work that you have set up. That'd be like rewiring the house when the house wasn't the issue. It was the power company. You just rewired totally. it. But now you just, you just, you know, MacGyver wired it, kind of put together something, you know, not that great, better, not as good as what was actually already done in the house. And now you've got this, you know, hodgepodge of wires and extension cords running everywhere. And 
you've got something that's a lot worse than than what you actually had to start with if you would have just yeah. been patient and or, let alone you know meta needs to go back into its earning phase when you do all that stuff. right yeah so you know when i think about benchmarking what are the best use cases for uh veros because you guys are doing some things you uh you sent me an email uh boy maybe just a couple of days ago about some other interesting things that you guys were digging into even on like you know ad creative and stuff like that but what are some other things outside of benchmarking that, that your data is able to help people uncover? Yeah. So I think like bet, like the way I look at it is that our sort of unique angle is always around comparisons, but like benchmarking is just one thing that you do. So like, and I, I say benchmarking is how do I compare to my competitors, right? Like, sure. you know, am I good or bad? And if bad, where? So you can see like, uh, you know, your cost per purchase and your ROAS, and then you can see if it's low, uh, like if it's not good relative to others, and then you can see where. So you can say, oh my God, my click-through rate is absolutely horrible on prospecting campaigns in this country relative to others. I need to go fix that. Or my conversion rate is too low. In this situation, I need to go up my uh, landing page. Or a lot yeah. of times people will be like, actually, we're really good on, you know, meta ads, but we suck on YouTube or... Um, like we're really good on performance marketing in general. So we should really spend our time on LTVs, like a lot of that type of stuff. Um, but that's yep. just one thing, you know, another really main use case is like what we were just talking about with the, with the Facebook ad bug of was it me or was it the market? Mm -hmm. That stuff happens all the time. The weather changes and, you know, yes. things spike or things plummet and it's not you. And sometimes it is you, and you need to know that. Uh, or there's a bug, like this bug was massive, but there's these bugs yep. every month. Uh, like they really happen a lot. And so uh, just, you know, understanding, like having that clarity in that context is, uh, is critical. Agencies use it often um, to put in their reporting. So it's like constantly in their weekly reporting, sometimes a client would miss budget. And they're coming in and saying like, look, the, the whole market, this happened. We actually beat right. the marketing in terms of that. Um, and that's important, right? Beating the market really is the important. key. It's really important. And if you, th if you look at like, you know, the W promotes of the world and those stuff, I mean, they've, they've built these tools internally uh, to, to have mm -hmm. those arguments, but the smaller agencies, how are they going to do it? Like one, they, they don't have the data. Um, but two, even if they did, it's a ton of work to, to, you know, pull this stuff together and, and make it right. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the last main, main use case that I'd say is around, um, like budget allocation. So how are you, uh, splitting your, uh, spend across channels versus others? Uh, like, you know, sure. performance max is. You're at 20%, but everyone else is at 35% of budget and you're spending 15% on YouTube, but really your competitors are only spending 3% on YouTube. So it's not necessarily bad or good, your strategy, but you should know how, how that compares to others and, and you know what some million dollar a month spender is doing because they probably have some stuff figured out. Yeah, it just gives you insight into, you know, where you might be, you know, let's just say SWOT analysis, like where are you strong? Where are you weak at? Like, gives you the opportunity to say, maybe there's some way that we can dig in more on this channel, or maybe we're over leveraging this particular channel. Uh, and, and to your point, it's not necessarily a bad or good. It's just, a, it's just an indicator to say, hey, take a deeper look at this. Right, 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 right. Well, and I, I like that you called out weather too. Not that you guys track weather, but that's something that I've personally seen uh, as a result of... Uh, it's you know, a real I, thing. I, oh, it's a very real thing. And I can remember there was a Coke company uh, and I don't say their name because I don't have necessarily permission to talk about that. But there was a Coke company that we were working with. Uh, and I can remember, and I don't remember which year this was, uh, but it was unseasonably warm. And, and this could have been 2020, 2021. I don't remember. But it was unseasonably warm compared to, uh, you know, the the previous winter as far as we're coming into uh, uh, November, December. And it, sales were slow, just significantly slower than they had been. Uh, and then I think we came into, you know, some type of winter apocalypse. And, and I remember this, you know, this big cold front that came in and all of a sudden sales, you know, went through the roof again. And it's one of those things where, you know, you can look at it, you know, in aggregate and understand that you're doing all of the right things. But there are these other factors that need to be uh, looked at when you're understanding the macro yeah. versus the micro within the accounts. I, I, I'll give you an even more specific example of the weather thing that I, I heard last year. 
from a client he said, oh my God, Vero saved me because like our CPAs were spiking and we weren't getting any conversions. I didn't know what was going on. And then I saw it happen to everyone. And I realized, I realized why it was happening. It was this British guy and some British brand. And I'm like, whoa, oh, that's like, I'm happy that it helped. What, what, what happened? And he's like, it was the first sunny day in London in three months. So everyone was out in the park and no one was buying yeah you know, it's like so specific but it's real it's real stuff absolutely yeah and, and i mean we've seen very similar things like that too when you know even when we were coming out of uh covid there was a, a coffee company we were working with and, and at the time i want to say that they were up 300 percent year over year i mean we were just massively growing them uh, and a big part of what we were looking at you know from a macro trend perspective uh was just even just the basic demand for coffee at home that's that's the 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 demand we were looking at. Um, but we also like to look at anti-demands. And so we were looking at coffee near me. Cause if you're looking for coffee near me, you're you're looking to buy at Starbucks or Caribou or Dunn Brothers or wherever you like to go. And uh and so whenever you know a lot of the restrictions loosened up and people can start going back outside again, um demand for coffee, uh coffee at home still was pretty high when you looked for that. But the demand for coffee near me, near me spiked significantly. And so, you know, they went from being up 300% year over year to, let's say, 280% year over year. And, you know, they're a little bit worried. And it's like, well, OK, but, you know, the demand changed in a very significant way. And you're only yep. down this 20% difference here from where you were. And so it helps to understand, like you said, those bigger macroeconomic movements. Right. It really does. Yeah. So. You know, what when you're thinking about improving e-commerce businesses, because you see a lot of data, are there certain things that stand out to you as far as, you know, the shining stars? Uh, and this is we're getting into aggregate data as opposed to getting into the benchmarks. But are there certain things maybe from a spend perspective or, you know, something that you're seeing in the numbers? You're like, these are the things that seem to be resonating the best that the, the companies that are performing the best right now. Um, tactics or anything you know that's a really good question i i don't think i have like a super smart answer to that to to, to be honest i think that's something that we want to get into around sure. like like you know we get asked that all the time like all right our cpms are super high um relative to others like what are the what are the ones with low cpms doing uh and and i think that that's like going to be a very exciting step for us and one that we haven't uh one that we haven't tackled yet well, and here's a, you brought up CPM and I'm glad that you did. And, and I don't know if you have an answer for this one uh, or not uh, as well, but yeah. it would be an interesting look that I think you have the data to dig into. Um, does the low CPM actually even matter? Um, and I think it's uh, right. what, what uh, Barry Hot talks all the time about how CPMs don't matter. We've personally yeah. talked about this for years as well internally, where we, uh, oftentimes you'll see there's a, a uh, lower CPA and a higher return on ad spend with a higher CPM. And that's mind boggling to anybody that's uh, uh, familiar with, let's just say the old school media buying tactics where you base, you, you bought based on CPM, right? And you'd go to the, the media network and you say, here's the CPM that we negotiated. And, and that was fine. Whereas these algorithms now they're looking at CPM uh, and, and they're saying, well, I'm going to charge a little bit more premium here towards these CPMs because I'm reaching the people who are actually going to make that difference, right? Like, have you seen any kind of a correlation where yeah, actually no, CPM is positively correlated with, with performance? It's, it, it's, it's, it's spot on. Um, and I'm, I'm a huge, uh, I'm a huge Barry fan. And, and, and I, I like sure. that he's always preaching that. I, 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 I would actually go farther to say like, none of it matters if your CPA is good. Like that's why, yes. like in in Veros in the dashboard, there's like this red, yellow, green chart of uh, the overall metrics, and so it's like, and the leftmost side is ROAS and CPA, and mm -hmm. I, like how I tell people to use it is like if ROAS and CPA are green, move on. Just it, like it doesn't matter if one is red and one is green and one is yellow in the funnel because at the end the funnel is working. So, right. okay, you paid a bunch to get eyeballs, but like you got them on the right eyeballs and they're clicking right. and they're buying. Don't, don't mess with it. You know, like even if you could optimize it a little bit, like it's, it's, it's actually, uh, it's actually super performing well. But I do think that where it does come in is you have a, a high CPA, let's say like your CPA is in red relative to everyone else. And then you have to figure out where is the problem. 
And, you know, sometimes a really high CPM is the problem. Like everything yep. else is normal, but you're spending $20 to get eyeballs versus, uh, versus $10 for everyone else. And if you could bring that $10 that down and keep the same metrics, then you're in a good spot. Yeah. So I think yeah. it's, it, it's, it's only important when you're, you're diagnosing when, when something is wrong or you're trying to fix something and you're trying to figure out where in the funnel, because everywhere in the funnel is improvable. Uh, it's just, you shouldn't be improving like random metrics unless something is broken and then you should be improving the one that's broken. Yeah. No, like, that's so hot. I mean, whole thing. I've seen people do that. They've actually damaged the bottom of the funnel by focusing on the top of funnel and, and you know, they'll say, Oh, well, our CPM or our CPC is too high. So we're going to focus on uh, changing that and lowering those numbers. And it ends up creating damage on the other side of it, because to your point, none of the other stuff really matters. As long as the bottom of funnel metrics are where they need to be. Right. Those all are just indicators that say, hey, you're on the right track. And that's where I like um, benchmarking, let's say, specific to your store on that particular area where you say, sometimes ignore the benchmark of what other your competitors are doing, especially if you've got the CPA and the ROAS where you need to be. Um, right. You now find out your CPM, your your ideal CPM is $10. Now, if you start changing on your ideal CPM, if your individual CPM goes to $20, you can likely bet that probably something might happen here in the next day or two or even that day that is going to uh, change your bottom of funnel metric because you know that the $10 CPM is resulting in the bottom of funnel you need. All of a sudden that's doubled. You'd say, hey, maybe we need to pay attention. Here's a red flag within our own. But that $20 CPM in that context could still be lower than all of your competitors. And it doesn't matter. It's just the idea that it's changed for you specifically. Right, right. And we were very intentional about like, like even though it's on the bottom of the funnel, we like when we visualize it, we show it at the start. Because and we, we maybe as we're talking, I'm thinking like we should even get more aggressive with it. Like just show those. And then like you have to keep scrolling or something to get to the lower part. Um, just because, yeah, it's like, you know, the whole game is return on ad spend, right? Like at the end of the day. And so if you, if, if that is healthy, nothing matters. If it's not healthy, then things matter. It's you right. know, similar to going to the doctor's office, right? Like if, if you're healthy, he's not going to start doing random, like, you know, checks and, and like, right. he's not going to just do all the surgery on you. Right. right. But like, if you're not healthy and he can't figure out what's going on, then he's got to start, you know, doing more invasive uh, type work. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that that's the key to uh, anything is don't make changes where they don't need to be if, if everything's moving the way that it needs to move. Um, and right. we see that happen right. way too often. Um, right. Where do you think the future of maybe not necessarily Veros, maybe Veros, benchmarking in general is going. And I know this might be a sensitive topic because there's always going to be things that you're you're not wanting to share out to the public just yet. But, you know, are there any hints, you know, some of the stuff that's going on with AI right now is making it very interesting for people to use their data a little bit better and find their own individual metrics. But what do you see as the progression of this? Yeah, I mean, my my goal is that it becomes like, your data, like, you know, today, let's say you start a, you start a company, um, like in the SaaS world, everyone gets like mixed panel and amplitude and Google, you know, Google, everyone gets Google analytics, also an e-com. Um, but you also, you know, may get some other analytics software, uh, in, in e-com and that's all for how you're doing. My goal is that it's always going to be how you're doing and how you're doing relative to the market. Whether those are the same or different, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not really sure how, it like I have my theories of how it evolves, but you know, it could go many ways, but like that, that context of knowing how you're doing, like knowing your revenue of today, that added layer of knowing your revenue today versus how that moved uh, versus yeah. um, your competitors, like that is, I, I hope where things are going, like that yeah. spreadsheet it's that you so get hot. that green yep. or red every day up or down, yep. there's going to be another column. That's how did the market do? Yeah, I, I love that. And, and I like, you know, I'm, I'm even envisioning this, uh, uh it potentially as, you know, 
candlestick type charts, which I which I like that you already have. Um, you, you guys look at things quartile based uh, as well. Yeah, because I think that's so much better than looking at averages. Averages are helpful, but they're 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 only helpful to an extent. Once you begin getting a, a big enough data set, I feel like having the quartile uh, yeah. makes a world difference. And I don't know if you remember this. There was a, a chart that I shared out um, children's brand apparel. Um, and uh, I would say it was, you know, children's brand, uh, maybe AOV $50, uh, spending $100,000 a, a month or so. And um, you, you, the way that you guys have it is there's, there's, the, there's the bottom 25th percentile. You've got your, your median, you've got your top quartile, and then there's you. And you can, you know, you see your own line. And um, we yeah. obliterated the whole rest of the chart. I don't know if you remember yeah, this, but yeah. I, I just appreciate it where it's like you could, you just squished all the rest of them down and you couldn't even see anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's actually a hard, uh, it's actually a hard uh, UI problem to solve is like if one line is so far off from the others, like how do you, but yeah, I, I, I remember that. And, and you know, that I, I you guys are, are crushing in, in many ways. And, and I, I think that we're able to, like, it's fun that we're able to show quantitatively uh, right. to people when they're doing really well. Like, I'm hoping that this stuff gets people promotions. It should. Right. You know, if, if you can improve, if you can go to your boss and say, look how much better I am than everyone else. Like, it doesn't get better than that. You, right. you know, you can't go in and like, like, what is the better uh, solve than, look, we're going against head to head all our competitors and I'm all green, man. Like, right. I'm the best of the best. Right. I, we use it. I mean, it's one of my favorite things about your software is is actually just using it to send the clients or even leads and just say it's like, hey, if you want to know how we do, this is how we stack up, right? Right. right. Um, something else that I feel like a lot of people uh, listening could relate to is just founder stories in general. Uh, a, a lot of people end up going through, let's say, similar things to what you did, and and I remember you telling me a little bit about the the original days, the MVP of your product. Um, and what that looked like. I, and do you mind telling that story? Is that one you're willing to share? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, th there are a bunch of funny uh, like stories from, from that time, but, but yeah, so, so the, 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 the original MVP, I mean, for, for context. So, uh, I, I started this, uh, with my co-founder, Lior, uh, Lior is this, I mean, super like Israeli uh, NSA equivalent, um, and he spent like five years there. And then he came out, and he was first employee. One company that's like six hundred million dollar exit. Another one. He's just he's the best. Love it. And um, like I, I am the luckiest person to to have landed him. And so he and and I'm not technical. So he was building all these things that we were very scrappy. We were at the start. We had no no funding or anything. We were getting my apartment. And so, you know, we were really trying to trying to to launch and just just get clients because our product's meaningless without any data. Right. So we got like five, ten uh clients just from, you know, network, hustling, whatever. And but the MVP, because we didn't want to waste time like writing code on a product that we didn't know, like we didn't really know what people wanted yet um, sure. or how to build it. So the first Actually, the first version was just spreadsheets, but then at some point we we had a dashboard. And that dashboard, people had to uh, tell us before they were logging in, and we would have to like I don't actually know why this was the case, but we'd sure. have to like spin up like a server to have them log in. It wasn't like a live website or anything like that, which sounds which sounds completely uh, ridiculous. And then. Um, what we uh we had uh we were in a we did a y combinator and we were in an interview the interview there and the interview is this like famous interview of it's it's 10 minutes okay and it's just rapid fire it's you don't even remember what happened there sure like people practice these interviews i have friends that practice the interviews by standing there there's like a list of questions on the tv that's rotating they have to respond in in like i think it's 15 seconds where someone else is throwing socks at them and they have to like dodge <laughs> socks. Just because it's so hectic during the interview that you have to prep. And so, and during it, they basically never ask for a demo from like everything I could read because they have so much to learn on your sure. business. Um, but five minutes in, they come out of nowhere and ask for a demo. 
And this product, you had to, <laughs> it, it didn't work. Like you had to spin something up before. And so I was like somehow stalling where we were sitting here and I was like hitting his leg <laughs> and he like, he, he got it, uh, he got it ready to go in like, I don't know, 20 seconds, 25 seconds. And then we put it up and even when you like put on the server, it worked like one out of three times or something. And, but, but, you know, luckily, luckily it worked and everything was fine. And I don't think that they, they knew what happened, but, uh, but yeah, at the, at the, at the, at the start, it, it has to be like that. And it's, it's the most fun. I mean, it worked. You guys got into Y Combinator and, and that was, you know, a really good deal. Um, the sock thing cracks me up because, uh, I've got, uh, three daughters in, in the, the 13, 10 and seven. And I want to say it was the, the 10 year old who at the time was maybe eight. And playing basketball, and that was one of the things I used to do with her all the time. It was like when you know her older sister was practicing and would be at her practices. Like, okay, just get your basketball, and as she's dribbling with that, it's like I I throw a glove at her right, and she'd have to catch it with her other hand, and then switch <laughs> hands, and then throw a glove back. And there is something to be said for for that, but I've, yeah. I've never heard that in the business use case. So I, I like that idea of just throwing yeah, socks at yeah. somebody. Yeah, get them off their handle, game. We can handle that. You can handle any any pace, you know. You can handle getting uh, thrown the idea of launching a server to in the middle of a Y Combinator meeting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so, uh, but, but it, yeah, it's I, I I love the concept of that interview. Like it's it's just so, anyone I know that did it, even when they didn't get in, just had so much fun. Yeah, I, and I think you were telling me a little bit about um, you know Y Combinator and just even just like raising funds in this kind of environment and what that's been like too. Yeah. So, uh, so, so YC for us was, a, was a really, really great, uh, experience. I mean, basically, you know, you, you, you spend three months in San Francisco, um, you're with some of the smartest people in the world and it's not necessarily like credential smart, you know, like there was sure. a couple of guys that were, they were like 20, 20 years old. They had dropped, they, they grew up in Columbia. They had dropped out of Columbia when they were like at, uh, out of some high school in Columbia when they were 17, built some company. Now they're like on their second one. A lot of those, it's a so lot hot, of those yeah. people. And then you also get the, like, you know, we're working with these two MIT PhD in applied AI that are building this like you know, AI software that we're don't even we're, speak you know, the same language. language as us. Right. Right. And so it's like, you have both ends of the spectrum there in terms of like the, the types on paper, but everyone is just hustlers. And yeah. you're, you're in these, uh, you, you basically get put in a cohort and every week you meet with that cohort and the cohort and like, uh, partners that work at YC. And the partners are all like post exit uh, founders that are very impressive. And basically like in these, there's like an agenda for the meeting, but uh, in the meeting, it like starts with like, what did you do last week? And the people are so impressive that they're just coming out with like all the, like one guy signed some $150,000 deal. And you know, another guy just like redid uh, his whole product in a week, and you know, sure. someone else like <laughs> spun up some amazing marketing campaign. And it's just every week you see the momentum, and it that's what like the like the term accelerator, like you know, yeah. YC is technically an accelerator. Like I really understood what it is because we're all competitive. I'm super competitive, and so you know, I'm going into these meetings, and I'm just like, you know, screw that. Yeah. Like I want to, I want to show that I did the most i got the most customers you know the most revenue the most like impressive sort of thing and so but everyone is in that mindset and so everyone is sort of racing against each other in like a friendly way you're also trying yep. to help each other you're, like anyone who's trying to sell you something you you, you want to buy it if you can um yep. and so you know th th there's lots of that but it really really pushes you forward um and it makes you focus on the right things. You know, I think mm -hmm. for anyone who started a company, I think that they, they'll they'll relate to it. Um, that you know, at the start, you're kind of just like sitting with like a whiteboard, you're like talking to a bunch of people, probably like irrelevant people that like shouldn't even comment on like what you're trying to do, and you're like strategizing, and you're 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 kind of like a I don't know, the napkin in the wind type thing, like sure. just wasting your time in a way. 
And I feel like everyone goes through this process. And, you know, Lior and I definitely did, even though we were scrappy, we were wasting a bunch of time, like talking and strategizing and stuff, which is, it's important, but it's up to, right. it's up to a point. And then, and YC is just, they're just stop. They're like, stop with that. There's two things you should be doing. One is you should be getting customers and you should be talking to them about what else they want. And two, yeah. you should be writing code. Nothing else. Nothing yeah. else. Don't go to conferences. Don't go to meetups. Don't write a blog. Don't do anything. Just yeah. get that and grow. And and that, that's and and when you have those targets, like when you basically have all you need to do is grow, you know, five percent a week. It doesn't matter how you do it. Then it's like very focusing for you and very good for your business. Um, yeah. Well, and that's so, the same. That's that's literally what the benchmarking is doing for you guys too. Where, you, like you said, it's like focus on the bottom of the funnel, focus on those metrics. Yeah, the other things are fine, but like keep your focus where it needs to be. Otherwise, it's very easy to get distracted. And you end right. up spinning around in a lot of different directions that aren't productive. Right, right, totally. And it's also it go like, you know, a lot of things we learn are still very baked into like how we build product. Like, I, I, you know, you'll see that b basically all the features that we have are just user requests. Like, it's just, and that's where the filters come. We're not, we don't, we don't necessarily like know. Okay, sure, you know. People need to filter by objectives or by videos versus photos. It's more like someone will be like, yeah, I'm not using it. And we'll be like, why? And they'll be like, well, because, you know, you're combining prospecting and retargeting campaigns. That's completely that's meaningless for me if you combine them. You have to yep. you have to split them out. And we're like, all right, no problem. You know, and in like two days, we'll go and we go and do that. And so... It's like a lot of those learnings are still there, even though, you know, we're, 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 we're a lot bigger than, than we were then. Yeah. So you're driven, obviously, like you said, competitive, you're competitive. Yes. Uh, you, you have a, a desire, a penchant for data and accurate data that is benchmarked out nicely. Why? Uh, was there something in your childhood or something that made you this way? Have you just always been gravitated and drawn towards this, Did, you know, a sports league or something like what, what made you the person who could be successful at this endeavor? Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've thought about this question a lot, uh, like, or this type of thing. I, I think it came from when I was, a. Uh, when I was a kid, I was really bad at school. Like I just, I couldn't be in the box that they mm. set. Like I couldn't, you know, on the field trips when you stand in a straight line and like you walk and, you know, or you have to be like super quiet in class. Like, like you know, you're, you're 70 yeah. years old. Why? I don't, I still don't know why that's the case. And I actually think it's pretty normal that I wasn't able to do it, but I never was. Right. I never was able to to connect to like the test of, I need to remember what year and month this war happened or what the commander of the, some, you know, army's middle name was like, I just, it, it was always me. It was, I, I wanted to learn about the war. That was interesting to me. But sure. like, as we all know, when you're in, you know, middle school, elementary school, like actually knowing what happened isn't important. It's like memorizing the random facts that was important. And that was always mm. hard for me. And I, I just, I struggled. I got bad grades. I was in the principal's office a lot. And the thing that I, the thing that I was good at was I was good at sports at the time. Like I just played soccer all the time and I just threw myself in there and I got really, really, uh, like, I don't know. I just loved the, the competition of competitive sports. And so I mm -hmm. think that that was like really ingrained in me. Cause I always really wanted to win because that was the only place I could win. Like I was sure. losing everywhere else. And so I really want to win. And then, you know, as we all do from being kids and, you know, somehow someone messes you up that I just still have that chip on my shoulder that it's like, I'm going to prove that fourth grade teacher wrong or something, you know? <laughs> Mrs. Smith, this is for you. <laughs> I actually don't remember. I don't, I don't remember a lot of their names, but, but I have their faces in my head for sure. That's funny. I remember, I think every one of my teacher's names, uh, even my, my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Euless, like all the way through, like for some reason, their names have stuck with me. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they're haunting you. Like they're haunting me. <laughs> maybe. No, I, I feel like I, I actually, I did well in school. I was, 
I was uh, maybe maybe fairly book smart and and uh, a little less street smart. So uh, I, I did I did just fine there. Um, but I, I appreciate what you're talking about with sports being an outlet uh, for that. Um, let's just say like that that warrior mentality. Like there's there's something that's in us genetically. You know, let's just say bloodline for generations of of warriors uh, who. We have a desire to want to go and conquer and achieve, and and there's not necessarily a bad thing for that if it's done in in a in a kind in the right way. But sports give you that outlet to be able to to go and do that, and I think that that's a really good thing. And I I enjoy sports for that reason, and and I, I have my kids in sports, and I think there's something to be said for the teamwork, cooperation, but also it's like go and put it all out there on the field, right? Like two a days, like right. let's let's give it everything you've got. Right. Right. And I wonder how how that sports and stuff, or I, I don't know what it is, how that impacts impacts like risk tolerance. Like I think mm. starting a at least like a tech company, like it it has a lot of you you need a lot of risk tolerance, which which I for some reason have. Like I I actually don't don't know that that's a good thing. Uh, like I you know like the risks come with failure too. Like you fail yes. a lot, and so I I I have a lot of that, and I think you need to because. Like if you think about it, so so you raise you raise VC money, the mm -hmm. VCs want you know billion dollar plus businesses, and it's it's quite a different um, approach to build a let's say a ten million dollar business than a billion dollar business. You actually, sure. when you're at that ten million dollar business, you actually have to like sacrifice the whole thing to mm. to go for the for the billion dollar shot. You have to swing for it. Yeah. And at, at the cost of that. And so, you know, these are like very big bets and risks that, that you're, you're taking. And so I think like you, you need to enjoy those risks and it, it can't haunt you because if it does, then, then you probably won't be able to, to, to go do that. So I actually, and I don't know where that part comes from. Like I know where the competitiveness comes from, but I don't know where that part comes I think it was Ray Kroc who said something along those lines. I'm going to butcher his quote, but it was something basically like, if you can't tolerate risks, like get the heck out of business. Uh, and it was something to that effect. And and I think that to your point, um, you to, to start a business, you almost have to be okay with like putting on blinders on like a horse that's in a race or something saying that it's like, I'm not even going to look at a lot of these other risks because yes, there are. And there's enough risks that will immobilize you from being able to do anything. But you can't you can't accomplish it if you're not willing to take that risk and just go for it and and being right. willing to pivot and, and all that's fine. But it's, you got to have that tolerance for that risk. Yeah, pivoting is part of it, too. It's like you have to you have to say, all right, I'm pivoting. Like, you know, it's it's just the it's it's the game. Uh, yeah, like that's that's the game that like a SaaS founder gets gets into. Yeah. Yeah. When an e-commerce founder as well. No. Uh, speaking of just a little bit about like who is Yarden Shockhead, uh, there's also a, a book I remember you telling me about that uh, was was pretty good. I think it might even be on your shelf if, if I remember last time we talked here. Um, I think it was called Quiet. Uh, yeah. And, and just like how that book has helped shape you and your understanding of like who you are, but also like management and leadership and people on your team. Like, Tell me more about that book. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so... It's it's a I I, I recommend everyone uh, to read it. It's a very special book. Uh, it's it's about introverts actually. It it explains what an introvert is really well, and it's also uh, talks about like the the power of introverts. Um, and I I I'm a an outgoing person, but I'm I'm always a I'm, I'm I always have this internal conflict because on the one hand I'm outgoing, but on the other mm -hmm. hand I feel like. I need a lot more alone time than the average person. Like I need to go on walks alone. I need to read alone. I need to, you know, just spend time myself, go to the gym, like, and, and, you know, be, be in my own head and, and, and focus and things like that. And so yeah. it was always conflicting for me because, you know, I, I'm outgoing. I have outgoing friends and they're always wanting to hang out and they always want to do things. And like, I could never keep up. And the other thing that's, it sounds pretty random is like, you know, I'm, I love a lot of types of, I'm a big music fan. I like a lot of types of music, but I really love sad music. Like, I don't know why, but it just gets me going. Sure. And, and I'm reading this book. Someone had recommended it to me and 
I'm reading these things and I see like the attributes of what she's writing about an introvert. And it's, it's like one by one, these like random personality traits that I have that I just have always thought were just random. And she's just naming them. And it, it was amazing for me. And, and I think that, you know, a lot of people will be surprised that they actually probably are introverts. Um, mm -hmm. At least for me, I had always sort of thought that like an extrovert is someone outgoing and an introvert is someone shy. Sure. Um, but, but it's actually not the case. An introvert is someone who regains his uh, battery, recharges batteries by being alone. An extrovert is someone who recharges batteries by being around people. It's not necessarily yeah. a, by like if someone's shy or, or outgoing, it, has, it doesn't really have anything to do with it. Um, and so I, at least, I don't know, for me, it was always like a misconception kind of. Um, and I just learned a lot about myself from that book. And I learned a lot about other introverts and like the ability to sort of respect them. And like sometimes it talks yeah. a lot about how group projects or like how in the U S group projects is kind of like, it's kind of broken the system that you're forced. Like you go to Har some Harvard MBA and everyone is like doing these group projects together. But like a lot of times people actually, there's a lot of people that just do really good work in their own quiet uh and better and then you know maybe they can like deal with things async or stuff like that mm -hmm. and a lot of developers usually have those personality traits and i'm seeing it now in barrows that like you actually do have to just give them their space like no meetings yeah. no get out of their way and if you want write something and they'll respond and so there's like a lot of really important things that you learn about managing too yeah. Well, and, and I appreciate the idea of just, it's like you said, it's, it's how you get your, your charge. Um, I'm an extroverted extrovert. Yeah. People who know me know that I'm definitely outgoing, but I, I get charged up by being in a group of people. My wife, you know, if we have company over, you know, she'll say that it's like, I'm, it's like somebody just gave me crack cocaine or something. It's like, I'm off the walls. Like I'm, I'm elated when there's like an audience right. for me to entertain and dazzle or whatever that might be. Um, and, and I get charged up from that. Uh, whereas, you know, she's an, like, like you, she's an outgoing introvert where it's like, it, it right. she loves having people over, but it's like, she needs after, after party, I'm, I'm, you know, on cloud nine. She's like, I need a break. I need to just kind of like right. go and At like, some point, she wants to tell you. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and so I, I think that there's something to that in being able to understand how that impacts your team as well. And, and like you said, it, there may be like, maybe that's true for most of the developers, but not all the developers. And you might find out, okay, well, this particular developer, they're, they're still energized by being around people. So, you know, I include them in these types of things or whatever that might be. And just understanding who your team is and, and how they're, they're energized, I think is an important piece of, of success in, in moving the company forward. Definitely. I would also just as an aside, I'd love to come to one of those dinner parties. I mean, sounds, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's fun. You make your way to Minnesota, uh, we will have you over for sure. Um, yeah, man. so, you know, before we end here, cause we're getting towards the end of the time here, I, I like to do some kind of like a silly end the, the call with something personal game or something like that. And, and the one that I was thinking for you would be, um, uh, just like show and tell. And so I don't know if you guys ever did show and tell when you were in like kindergarten or anything, but it's just like, Hey, what's something that's around you that you want to show us and tell us about and, you know, kids bring in their, you know, plastic dinosaur or whatever that might be. But is, is there something in your office that you have that you're like, oh, this is cool and personal? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm looking at, at the view behind me. So I have this bookshelf. I have a bunch of books. We talked about a book. So I have this, uh, I have this camera here. I'm a film camera lover. Uh. Um, so basically it's like, I mean, I'm sure, you, I don't know, maybe you had one when you were a kid or something, but it's like, there's, there's 36 roles here. Uh, there's 36 pictures per film. And it, it's just like, uh, it's, it's, it's very special because first of all, you know, we're so used to, uh, immediate gratification, yeah. instant gratification. You take pictures, you take like five of them just in case, then you go look at <laughs> yeah. them and know. And here, you know, first of all, this thing's kind of expensive, like the roles and getting it developed. So you're you're really only just taking one picture and you just like hope that it goes well. And a lot yeah. of times it does it, a lot of times it breaks, sometimes it comes out fuzzy, um, but it's super cool. And when the picture comes out right, it's just like you're with, you're with your friends or something, your family, and it's like from the 1920s, you know, yep. and everything is amazing. It's old school and it's like just, it's very special and it's very fun. And 
someone go take a picture and they hear that click and that buzz, like they get very excited. So I love it. I'm going to age myself a little bit here uh, because I'm also from the generation that I can remember getting my first digital camera and I was in high school and I think it was a two megapixel camera. It was definitely not attached to my phone at the time. And so um, I grew up taking film then as well for a while um, and nothing fancy when I was a kid. But, you know, it's like 110 or 35 millimeter. And I was trying to think it's like, oh, it almost looks like the old 110 camera. I don't know if you know what size film that's taking. No, I don't know. I th it sounds like 35. Like I, yeah. I feel like I remember seeing 35, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. But I remember, like you said, it's like you you take it and then you send it out to get developed, and you you get it back, and you're like, that's not at all like what I thought I took. It's like it was right. a, it was right. a learning experience of like patience and figuring things out. Right, and sometimes it's like the pictures don't even they come back black or something and you're like, wait, my whole Vietnam trip just got erased. <laughs> oh. uh, they're like, sorry, you know, somebody got messed up with the camera. Like these things break too a lot. Yeah. So. No, that I, I think that there's something special about just going back to some of the analog stuff and in, in just in life too. So, um, totally. Yarden, if people wanted to follow up with you, stay in touch with you, you know, check out more of what you're doing, what's the best place or places that they can go and be part of that? Yeah. Um, so our, our website is uh, varos.com, V-A-R-O-S dot uh, com. My email is just my first name at varos.com. So Yardena Varos. Um, yeah, you can email me, follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, I'm I'm very available, always happy to, to help in any way that I can. And I want to say thank you to you, William, for having me. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming out, everybody. Thanks for joining in and listening. And I uh, hope you were able to, to take away some good learnings here and enjoy some of our reminiscing about film cameras. Okay. <laughs> Appreciate See it. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Up Arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.